drift away like our endless number day welcome back to the second class on the gospel of mark let us begin in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen almighty lord our god we ask you to bless and anoint all of us as we proceed ahead to understand your word ignite within us the flame that we may constantly depend on you rely on you with our words and deeds we make this prayer through christ our lord amen in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen so we are with the gospel of mark and uh, let's do a short recap of what we have done we started with situating the gospel with the pre new testament times of the greeks the asmonians romans the herodians then we spoke about how the geography of the place can affect the gospel so we we just previewed galilee samaria judea the the four areas of the palestinian uh, map and then we went on to begin with the gospel of mark trying to understand who this person mark is to whom is he writing what is the purpose of his writing and we know the purpose of his writing isn't it the purpose of the writing of mark is that he wants to rekindle faith he wants to strengthen the people Christians were primarily suffering and they were being persecuted and were thinking whether God had abandoned them and therefore Mark is trying to tell them to strengthen their faith Mark is trying to tell them to not to give up on Christ he's trying to kindle their faith rekindle their faith and to strengthen them yes then we proceeded to see how these three gospels are connected with one another luke mark and matthew we came to understand the primacy of mark and then we did a few characteristics of the gospel of mark today in a very special manner we will try to understand markan style and literary method you see mark when he writes he's got a particular style of writing he uses certain methods of writing the first method that we shall reflect today is called inclusio you see this is very unique but before we do inclusio we need to understand what are literary uh, devices or what is a literary method that somebody uses in their writing if you have seen any paragraph uh, or read any paragraph in the newspapers you read quite a few paragraphs and Uh, not paragraphs but articles so what are literary devices what is the meaning of a literary device if you read a newspaper and you read an article in a newspaper you see how the person writes that article he uses a variety of methods he will give an example he will may give a story he may use different uh, ways to express a particular idea and and people use different literary devices when they want to express their idea so what does mark use is what we need to find out and when we understand what he uses we can understand the text a little more better example allusions or dictions or alliterations or allegory okay a fumism a flashbacks a foreshadowing imagery just oppositions these are all methods literary methods in which one uses this method to express their idea and the 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 idea which uh, which uh, mark uses the first idea is it is inclusio okay now what is inclusio inclusio basically is uh, inclusion we all know what is inclusion including everything together no but to understand inclusio we have to understand mark's text let us take mark 6 7 231 when you read mark 6 7 2 31 we see that mark speaks about uh, different things so he f- primarily speaks about sending the 12 apostles on a mission so if you divide this text of mark 6 7 to 31 we see that there are three segments so what are the three segments the first segment is about jesus sending the apostles the last segment is that the apostles return back So you see the reference at the beginning and at the end is about the apostles going and then coming. So so this is what Mark uses or Mark tells us. And in between 
we hear of another story which is the death of john the baptist is recalled so you you can check this out in mark 6:14 to 29 jesus speaks about the death of john the baptist he recalls the death of john the baptist so in between these two going and coming of the apostles is situated another text so this is called uh, inclusio wherein the repetition of the same language at the beginning and at the end of the section so it begins with the apostles going and it ends with the apostles coming back so this is called inclusio the paragraph in the center has got a bracket of the apostles going and coming so that is called inclusio we have another uh, example of inclusio if you if you are interested in understanding and and such type of methods are used by many 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 gospel writers so the gospel writers use these methods they will it is this is called an inclusio in the sense uh, if you take mark chapter 2 verse 1 to verse 12 so it begins with the paralytic being brought to jesus and at the end we have the paralytic leaving the scene so jesus heals the paralytic the paralytic is brought and at the end again jesus heals the paralytic but in between these two brackets we have some other content in the center so it is 2 6 to 10 we have dispute over jesus's authority to forgive the pharisees are questioning jesus yeah you can forgive how can you forgive so and jesus is defending his stance and 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 this is enveloped by the paralytic being brought to jesus and the paralytic being healed by jesus so this is called inclusio where the beginning and the end we have got the same idea in the center we have another idea okay now there is another literary device which mark uses which is similar to inclusio okay it is called intercalation intercalation where one story continued at the beginning and the end one story continues throughout but in between we have another story inserted so this is called intercalation especially in connection with stories where one story is being it begins with one story suddenly a new story enters and then the the first story which began continues example mark chapter 5 mark chapter 5 verse 21 begins with the jairus coming to jesus and asking uh, jesus to heal his daughter okay jairus's daughter is dying and he ask jesus to come and heal and then we proceed and then suddenly we have the hemorrhaging woman who touches jesus's garment and jesus turns and says who is it that has touched me power goes out of jesus so that is another story but are we in the first story yes jairus's story has ended no another story inserted and then we continue back to another story where jesus raises the daughter of jairus to life so the story continues but with an insertion of a new story it is called intercalation is it clear so when we we do this this is another method so we have done what is called inclusio inclusio has got one idea continued by the same idea continued and another idea inserted the the concept is the same but it is called another term to explain this especially in connection with stories okay especially in connection with events okay so that is what is called intercalation now there are other examples uh, of intercalation so so if you take uh, the chapter number 14 the priest the chief priest want to arrest and kill jesus chapter number 14 verse 1 and 2 and then at the end of chapter number 14 verses 10 and 11 judas arranges to betray jesus with the chief priest so you have the chief priest planning and the chief priest plan coming to a uh, fulfillment uh, towards the end where judas agrees and they know that the plan is fulfilled and in between these two one event the story which continues there is another story of a woman anointing jesus at bethany you see a totally another story not connected to the first and the second one another story there are though there will be connections here and there but primarily to for us to understand that it is a new story that has been inserted so this is the type of method which uh, mark uses very often 
So you, when you read the Bible, when you read the Gospel of Mark, it is good to go through and see such structures within the text to understand why is he doing so, what is he trying to say, what is that, uh, especially when, when things are placed at the center, uh, uh, you know, those uh, things are very important and they have got much more details to explain. They've got much more, uh, they, they're very interesting. It is interesting to know this, how he places these texts. So Mark uses another literary device which is called concentric structuring in which he, uh, he uses a particular step method which leads to a central idea and then moves out with the same idea that precedes the key idea. Uh, we take the example of uh, Mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 12 which begin with the healing. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven and the person is healed. From there we move on to chapter 2 verse 13 to 17. We say Jesus is eating with sinners. So we first have the healing, then proceed after that we have the, the healing, the eating with sinners. We then proceed to verses 18 to 22 of the same chapter, chapter number 2 of Mark. And Jesus is questioned about not fasting. Why are your disciples not fasting? Then we proceed to understand chapter 2, 23 to 28, where there again the discussion about eating on the Sabbath. So now we remember that eating was discussed just before in chapter number 2, 13 to 17. And now again we are discussing the eating on the Sabbath in chapter number 2, verse 23. So the concept of fasting is enveloped by two other ideas and the idea is of eating. But above them we have got another two ideas. And the idea about healing. So we began with the healing. Then we spoke about eating. Then we spoke about fasting. Now we again speak about eating. And chapter 3 verse 1 to 6, 6 again speaks about healing on the Sabbath. Jesus heals somebody on the Sabbath. So you see the structure is in a step format. Where the person moves from A to B and then to C. And then moves to B1 and then to A1. To take us to the key idea of the, the whole pericope is, to, is the discussion about fasting. So this is called a concentric structure of moving in to the key idea and then moving out with, an, with the same idea that preceded the key idea. Good. So we, we understand these type of structures are present in the Gospel of Mark. And, and he uses them to express his ideas. He uses them to express his, uh, his, uh, his, his message of Christ. So the text needs to be read carefully. And when you read, make an attempt to find these structures. Because these structures lead us to the key idea. And when we, we, we understand the key idea, we grow into a deeper knowledge of Christ. We go into a, a grow with a deeper knowledge of of his word and that is what we uh, uh, that is the endeavor for all of us isn't it that is our, what all we seek that is what all of us seek mark also uses another uh, literary device which is the series of three he uses this very often there are examples of three 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 in quite a few places in the gospel of mark so jesus predicts his death three times in chapter number 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. Peter Je denies Jesus three times. Chapter number 14, verse 68, 70, 71. There are three opinions of Jesus in chapter number 8. Who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? No. Some say Moses, some say Elijah. But who do you say that I am? Some say one of the prophets. So there are three opinions again. So three times Jesus goes to pray alone in the Garden of Gethsemane in chapter number 14. See, in, in the questioning of Pilate to Jesus, Pilate asks people three questions. So you see, there is a purpose for this threefold uh, usage. And what is the purpose? It may be a theological purpose. Especially since we know that number three was a symbol of God. We ourselves have got this Jesus Christians believe Jesus rose after three days and we have a trinity. So three is significant. It resembles God. It may also be a sign of an oral composition. So groups of three are common to oral materials of those times. Uh, because they are easy to remember. When we say one, two, three, they are easy to remember. They are pleasing to the ear. So this is another style of, of 
oral composition which is now put into into writing so that also could be one of the reason why he uses this three uh, a series of three another literary device we are trying to understand and when you uh, keep this in mind it will be easy for you to read the text uh, we are understanding another literary device which he uses it's irony what is irony irony is a figure of speech which words are used in such a way that their intended meaning is different from the actual meaning of the words so it may also be a situation that may end up in quite a different way than what is generally anticipated in simple words okay it's a difference between the appearance and the reality example okay so jesus is dying on the cross and the soldiers say hail king of the jews the soldiers are taunting but for us the readers of the text know that it is the real identity of jesus so you see it is irony the statement made has an opposite meaning incongruity between the characters in the story know how that statement is and with the readers how we understand it hail king of the jews for a soldier he is mocking but for us he is the king of the jews we are calling him king of the jews isn't it so the text in such a manner is placed in such a manner that it is it is it is uh, irony for some in the last class we also spoke of mark using one particular term very regularly and the term is immediately so this word is used 41 times in the gospel okay so if you take an average it's approximately twice per chapter though it is concentrated at the beginning of the gospel with 10 occurrences in the first chapter itself so what does it tell us mark wants to tell us that we need to understand things immediately it creates a sense of a rapidly rushing narrative to us immediately at once oh this thing happened that thing happened also to tell us that that we need to take immediate decisions for christ we need to take immediate action for christ so the early church was going through difficulties and it is saying we need to change our ways immediately now is the time you see so this is a very important concept for uh, for mark and he uses it in his literary narrative to explain to us that how the behavior of a christian should be how jesus moved from one event to the other immediately rushing us through the narrative and primarily it is concentrated as i said in the first few chapters leading us immediately 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 to his passion death and resurrection because for mark that is primary to understand the suffering which christ underwent so you see that is the way he uses the term we now come to understand another term uh, or another uh, theological uh, explanation within the gospel of mark and that is the messianic secret messianic secret it is the frequent command to silence in the gospel throughout the gospel and this is one of the key characteristics or the key features of the gospel of mark throughout the gospel jesus will tell to those whom he heals to those uh, people who are relieved of the evil spirit shh do not tell this to anyone now why would he do this why would jesus tell do not tell this to anyone so there are reasons why mark writes in this manner and and there are reasons why jesus tells the people not to disclose his true identity so the term messianic secret is quite a later term it was uh, coined by wilhelm wrede in 1901 okay so the when he went through the text he understood the text and he saw jesus constantly telling in chapter 1 chapter 3 chapter 5 chapter 7 chapter 8 chapter 9 constantly telling do not reveal 
my identity to others be silent you have been healed but do not tell others why let's let's take some examples okay in chapter 1 verse 25 demons are confessing jesus's identity and they are silenced okay in chapter 5 uh, persons who are healed they are silenced chapter number 8 a very uh, there is a center of the book okay at that point of time where where jesus where peter says no you are the son of christ disciples are told do not disclose it do not disclose it for mark jesus cannot be merely understood as a miracle worker no so mark why is mark no writing this or why is jesus saying that do not reveal the identity is because when jesus is doing a miracle okay it's the glory of jesus being manifested when jesus is healing the glory of jesus is being manifested the great authority the great power of god is at is at play so when jesus is doing all these miracles you know people would take him as a great miracle worker as a great teacher as a great prophet mark doesn't want that to happen mark doesn't want the people to merely think of jesus as a miracle worker or rather as any other miracle worker because during jesus time there were others present so but there is a purpose of his doing this so any identity according to mark without the suffering and death of jesus is inadequate you cannot understand jesus as only a glorious miracle worker or only as the healer but rather you have to understand jesus in totality that jesus is a healer but he is also the suffering messiah he is the messiah who will die so the command to silence is is mark's way of reminding the readers that they cannot be evaluating jesus prematurely so when the reader looks at the healing and he say wow he says hello wait do not decide as of now who this jesus is wait because if you decide jesus only depending upon the healings and the miracles that you are reading and you are seeing it would not be the right understanding of jesus true understanding of jesus will be obtained only at the end of the story and at the end of the story the centurion says indeed he is the son of god and when this is expressed through the real the dying of jesus the passion of christ and that is what mark wants to reveal to the people yes indeed this is the son of god who is yes the healer who is yes the miracle worker was yes no the the great deliverer but he is also the suffering servant he is also the one who is is dying for the people so and that is why he constantly uses this literary uh, technique called the messianic secret where the secret is that jesus is indeed the true savior of the world and his salvation is for all but he is the suffering savior what is also unique to mark is mark 12 32 to 34 with the scribe responds to jesus no explanation of the greatest commandment jesus says that he is not far from the kingdom of god a scribe is not far from the kingdom of god which is not found in other gospels all these aspects you know of uniqueness of mark are indicating to the fact that mark was interested in giving us the real essence the real presence or real uh, person of jesus okay and he didn't want to to take his audience away from the reality says jesus suffered the same as you suffered jesus underwent same as you are undergoing jesus was as human as you are and if he through his suffering death and resurrection conquered death you are capable of connecting yourself to jesus and then conquering your situation and that is the type of faith that he is kindling into the the people his audience and that is why he expresses this this unique material to his audience 
many people say that uh, women are neglected within the gospels and women were not given a uh, great importance and rather in the situation of today also women are not given great importance within the church but we see that the gospel writers have many examples of women who are part of Jesus's ministry so women in the gospel of mark is is a a very important aspect that we need to look at so we have got a variety of women whom Jesus interacts with so we've got the first and foremost we've got in chapter number 1 we've got Simon's mother-in-law okay then chapter number 3 we have Jesus's mother his brothers then we've got in chapter number 5 we've got the daughter of Jairus in the same chapter intercalation remember we did this last class women with the flow of blood chapter number 5 then we have got in chapter number 6 Herodias and her daughter further down chapter number 7 the Syrophoenician woman's daughter chapter number uh, 10 we've got Jesus is emphasizing on the command honor your father and mother okay chapter number 10 Jesus expresses the idea who are my brothers my sisters mom or my mother those who do the will of god no again chapter number 10 emphasis on women the mother of jesus in chapter number 12 again another case is brought forward to jesus and he is asked the woman with the seven husbands case you know whose wife will she be first second third fourth five six seven you know in chapter number 12 we've got the widow who contributes in a great manner chapter number 14 anonymous woman coming and anointing jesus feet so you know, chapter number 14 if you see a little more details you see peter's denial that serving girl who's there and peter denies no 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 i did not know jesus so that serving girl is present there at chapter number 15 we have mary magdalene and mary mother of james and joseph and salome who are present at the foot of the cross chapter number 15 again we further down we see women see to the burial of jesus chapter number 16 women go to the tomb chapter number 16 again jesus appears to mary magdalene so nobody can say that jesus did not interact with women or the women are, were not important for for the early gospel writers or for the early church women played a very significant role in the in the ministry of jesus during the time of jesus during the early church and so we understand that the gospel writers Uh, through when they when they put the gospel together and the gospel is presented to us that it the the women are an important aspect of the church and very much expressed through their presence as displayed in the whole gospel of mark we shall now attempt to understand the different names and titles that mark gives to jesus there are three major titles that mark applies to jesus and that is uh, the son of god messiah and son of man and traditionally all these titles that were uh, attributed by mark were known to the people and they were being utilized by people primarily if you take the title of the son of god son of god is a title applied to israel as god's people to a king at his coronation it was also applied to angels especially in the book of job connected to son of god it was also applied to the suffering righteous person wisdom 218 will speak of the suffering righteous person who is the son of god so son of god is very prominent trying to tell us that he is the appointed one he is he represents god he is god himself so mark in chapter 1 verse 1 will say the beginning of the good news of jesus christ the son of god the beginning of the good news of jesus christ the son of god so we understand Ma- what mark wants to tell also at the baptism of jesus the voice is heard you are my beloved son you are my beloved son and and to tell that you no know, the connectivity of jesus being divine Jesus being divine and now that divinity is amidst us son of god is present among the people 
even the demons recognize him as the son of god in chapter 3 in in chapter 5 again the demon recognize him as the son of the most high god okay at the transfiguration in chapter 9 we hear how uh, the voice is heard and it says this is my son this is my beloved okay so we constantly hear of this whole concept of jesus being the son of god to tell us that how this son of god is participating now into humanity and this brings us to the second title of jesus and the second title of jesus is son of man son of man now in the old testament especially in the prophet ezekiel he is often addressed by god as son of man son of man uh, in daniel chapter 7:13 a figure is described as one like a son of man received from the ancient days dominion and glory and kingship the son of man is one prominent title of jesus uh, given by mark indicating the humanity of jesus as we have heard earlier also how mark is comfortable in explaining the human nature of christ okay and this title especially the son of man appears during the passion death and resurrection of jesus so the the title is in connection with the suffering again so in chapter 8 there is the first passion prediction and in chapter 9 there is a second passion prediction and chapter 10 is the third passion prediction and it occurs in all these passion predictions the son of man came to give his life as a ransom for many see he came in so the, the son of man is in connection with again suffering and and we have done as we have understood in the in the title uh, in the the idea of the messianic secret when we spoke of the messianic secret we understood that jesus is divinity and humanity both have to be seen in line with the suffering that he undergoes at the uh, you see the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners the son of man has come to suffer again understanding the fact that mark's key concept is in connection with the suffering servant the suffering messiah and this brings us to the third title which he uses messiah or the anointed one when we speak of Uh, mark using the term anointed one in hebrew which is mashia and greek translation is christos we recognize that who were anointed who were anointed priests prophets kings these were the ones that were anointed in uh, early judaism and why were they anointed they were anointed because god chose them for a specific role for specific work so the anointed one he is not anointed just because he has to be anointed no he has got a responsibility so the anointed one is in connection with you no know, for a role or a or a work that he has to do and what is the role of the messiah what is the role of christ what is the role of jesus wherein mark uses the term no in one one he says the good news of jesus christ the anointed one Jesus speaks about one who bears the name of Christ 941 no Jesus relates and says messiah and son of david Jesus warns and they say and he says look here is the messiah no people may say look here is the messiah he warns about false people false prophets who are called as christ peter confesses and he says jesus you are the messiah you are the anointed one you know the son of man and then what does jesus reply he says the son of man must undergo great suffering so the son of man title or the the, the title of uh, son of god or the title of messiahship all for mark lead the people to that what sort of messiah is jesus to that messiah who is the suffering messiah he is the son of man who has to undergo suffering he is the anointed one who has to undergo suffering he is the son of god who has to undergo suffering coming now from the titles of jesus 
to the text that we shall be following up in the next classes to come but before we enter into interpreting the text we need to structuralize the text so we need to know where does the text fall so majorly there is a four stage narrative framework which the synoptic gospels have the preparation for ministry the galilean ministry the journey to jerusalem and the passion death and resurrection so even in the gospel of mark we have the same four stage narrative framework that means first jesus is prepared for ministry okay. then he is led to in galilee he does his ministry then he moves along to jerusalem and on his way he does his ministry in jerusalem he does his ministry and in jerusalem is the passion death and resurrection of jesus so it is a four stage narrative it moves from one stage to the other so in the gospel of mark chapter 1 1 to 13 is the preparation for ministry chapter 1 14 to 9 50 is the galilean ministry chapter 10 1 to 56 is the journey to jerusalem and chapter 11 1 to 16 8 we have the passion death and resurrection some scholars suggest that the verses that are present from verse 9 onwards of chapter 16 till the end are a later edition now to understand this you have to go to the footnote of your bible because every bible has got many footnotes and footnotes are very important so when you read the footnote you get the explanation why it is called an added version because some of the ancient manuscripts did not have this text rather this text is found in later manuscripts so when it is found in a, in later manuscripts and not in the ancient ones probably it was not present in the original okay this is one of the ideas which people uh, which scholars suggest that it was not present in the original and then later on some person added this extra part to the gospel which was then widely accepted by all scholars also have another opinion so they say that probably the older ending was not uh, was lost okay so verse 8 we have the text of the manuscript still verse 8 and probably there was a further ending to it which is no longer available to us which was no longer available to those people of a later time who wrote who copied or who 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 had these later manuscripts so somebody tried to complete the text so the the original ending might have been lost and we've got somebody who has added this text but we also know that the text is not contradictory to what we believe the text is in line with the other gospels because we find a similar ending in matthew we find similar ending in luke we find it also the ascension as mentioned here is also in the acts of apostles and also uh, a similar type of conclusion to the gospel in the uh, in the gospel of john so it is not against what we believe but it is only said that probably somebody added some stuff towards the end of the gospel uh, to this particular original text we accept it as canonical we accept it as the word of god because it was well accepted by everybody from those time till date so a short recap of all that we did today we primarily studied the literary devices used in mark we said he used inclusio he also used intercalation then we said he might have used concentric circles and we also explained it with very many examples he also uses the series of three if you remember jesus predicts his death three times peter denies him three times also he uses irony where the person is saying a particular thing but it is understood as something else also the term which he uses euthes which means immediately at once is what we studied then the key concept of the messianic secret is what we dealt upon the messianic secret as we know not to reveal uh, jesus commands not to reveal his identity and it is primarily because the author wants to uh, wants the people to have a proper understanding of uh, Jesus for his readers for his audience and his proper understanding comes only at the end where the the gentile centurion accepts Jesus 
we also studied a few other details we said we spoke about the women in in the gospel of mark then we spoke about the 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 framework of the gospel and, and then we also spoke about the ending of the gospel which could have uh, which uh, some suggest that is an addition to the gospel so yes this is all which we did today and with this i take your leave thank you very much god bless see you in the next session god bless Thank you, Father Walter, for that extremely informative second session. Um, it was. We, I'm sure we all have a lot to take away from it. I'm gonna probably shed light on a couple of things that I found extremely eye-opening. Uh, one of it was definitely the literary devices, be it intercalation, inclusio, uh, the concentric circles, but most importantly, the series of three. Um, that's something personally I feel like I've always noticed but never really understood the meaning. Uh, so that was quite an eye-opener for me personally. And um, other than the literary devices, I also really, really appreciated the messianic secret and understanding that. Uh, majorly because, you know, it shows us that Jesus could so easily be passed off and accepted very quickly as a miracle worker. Uh, which is something that everyone's very comfortable with but mark actually emphasized on the point that it should be that jesus should be seen holistically as the suffering messiah so that the right message is passed on to all of us so um these are the two that i really personally um loved and and you know i'm very thankful for uh, understanding bio this session um and i i really feel like you know we all could definitely take away these literary devices and while reading the gospel actually try and spot out uh, these different devices placed in different you know parts of the gospel so uh, i'm really looking forward to doing that um, and before we part, one question for all of you. I hope you all were paying attention because this is quite an easy one. Um, what was the word that was used almost, I think, 41 times in the gospel? Do you all remember? Do you all remember? That's right. It's immediately. So um, that was something that really got my uh, attention very, very quick. And I've actually noted that down. Uh, so great hope all of y'all had a lovely session and um thank you father walter once again we're all really looking forward to the third session